there and welcome again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here being back in Orlando, Florida. And as you can see, Mark I'm joined is back. by Mark Yay. once again. I'll be back with us again this week. Yep. And Traffic was heavy, but not too heavy to keep them from us. And our, my sweet patootie, Miss Alice. That's me. And here I am, and we're glad that you am, that you are there. Yes, so we are. we can be together. We're continuing on in our study. This, this is an interesting study. We're talking about the evidence of a redeemed life. Mm -hmm. You know, what should, we have new life in Christ, we should have a new lifestyle in Christ, and what should that new lifestyle be? Look like. <laughs> so this is our, our fourth session in this. Yes. Uh, the, the, we did an introduction, we talked about love, and last week we talked about joy, and today we're gonna to be talking about peace. peace. But before we do that, I'm going to ask my brother Mark to ask God's blessing upon our time together. Oh, oh Lord, it says, where two or three witnesses are gathered in your name, so are you, you. Lord, just please be with us and show us how to do peace correctly. Amen. 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 Yes, peace correctly, because uh, there's different versions of peace. And let me, let me, as I said when we started, if you, I don't know if you were, have been with us for all of the parts of this, the evidence of a redeemed life, okay? We're, we're looking, because Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, let a man examine himself. Mm -hmm. So this is about self-examination. You know, that we should be looking to our own lives and saying, you know, am I, am I exhibiting that life of Christ in me? Am I exhibiting that new life that Christ purchased or gave to me? And when we talk about evidence, evidence is kind of a legal term. Yes. You know, you go to you go to trial, and things are entered in evidence to prove or disprove a case, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So what we're talking about here, what we're talking about today, we're going to talk about peace. It's like you, you say to the judge, well, I'd like to enter this into evidence. Mm -hmm. And what you want to enter into evidence is the peace that you have. Lots of people have peace. Mm -hmm. Peace can be something that's very solid. Some peace can be something that's very fleeting mm -hmm. because there's definitely two different kinds of peace. So let me start by reading a scripture that shows that pretty clearly. This is Jesus talking in John 14, 27. He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So those words of Jesus make it clear that he and the world have very, very different ideas of what peace actually is, right? The world believes. When I say the world, I'm talking about people who are not redeemed. That's right, that's what I'm saying. I'm talking about those people who have not accepted or received have, that free gift of the Father's salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. They don't have that relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by the world. They believe that peace is the absence of conflict. Right? Well, how has that worked out? Not well. On the world stage, ever? Not really good. Not really good. I just want to take a moment to share with you something personal about that. All right? Okay. I was born in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Not long after I started school, I don't know, I was in, uh, I was like seven years old, eight years old, uh, when the Korean, the horror of the Korean War started. They called it a, a police action or conflict. It was a war. Yes. When people are shooting each other and they're dying, that's, that's a, war. a war. That's a conflict. And here, that, that war started 60 years ago, and it's still not resolved. I mean, it's in the news today. Right. That, that has never come. There's never been a peace treaty signed between North and South Korea or America and North Korea. Mm -hmm. After that, I was raised, as a, you know, growing up, I was raised with the constant reminders of the Cold War with Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in, I went to a private boys Catholic school and uh, every Friday in the, in the town I lived in, as most towns across the United States, they would test the air raid sirens because the threat of an imminent nuclear holocaust was always there. 
And in our Catholic school, you know, we had these little wooden desks, and they, they must have been magic because That's when the sirens went off, we jumped under the wooden desks because right. they would they would protect, protect you from those uh, new, right. nuclear thermonuclear devices going off, right? Mm -hmm. I went into the, the U.S. Navy to fly, and I'd only been in one month when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And if you know anything about history, it is said reasonably that that was probably the closest the world has ever come to nuclear holocaust. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were on the, uh, um, Kennedy and Khrushchev were nose to nose, and it, we were that far away from the, all the missiles flying. And as I said, I was in the military, and we had, uh, America had a defense plan, a strategy that was called MAD, M-A-D. Mutually assured destruction. That that was the plan. That we would make it clear to Russia that if they struck, we no matter what happened to the United States, they would be utterly and completely and absolutely destroyed. So that there was a mutually assured destruction, and that was the deterrent from them shooting off the missiles. Later, I did fly uh, on, on, in the Navy. I flew patrols around Russia, watching for their missiles and watching for their submarines. And I was on patrol uh, when I got flash traffic on the radio saying that our this American destroyers had been attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin. And that was the beginning of the Vietnamese War, which went on and on and on. And then, you know, I watched along with all of the rest of America and most of the world as the American embassy in Tehran, Iran, the capital of Iran, was overrun and the embassy personnel were taken captive and held hostage for 444 days. And then, of course, there was the first Persian Gulf War in 1991. And that was followed by uh, this, the second, by the way, the second successful attack on the World Trade Center. Remember, there was an attack on the World Trade Center that failed, in, I think, in 93, right? And that led to enduring freedom, the war in Afghanistan, that still rages. I mean, 13 years 13 later, years. whatever it is. And then, of course, the Iraq War, which started in 20, and which continues in 2014, my 70th year. In other words, there's been no, and you know what? That doesn't even take into consideration, doesn't take into account all the other significant conflicts around the world during that time. That's right. In Israel, Northern Ireland, the Falklands, Bosnia, uh, the constant conflicts that still rage through the continent of Africa, and on and on and on. In other words, there hasn't been any peace. And that's what the world has to offer. No peace. But Jesus said, my peace I give you. They and it's have time right. So let me just say, you know, uh, to make this more realistic in our conversation, <coughs> generally it's not the bullets that are being shot halfway around the world that challenge our own personal peace mm -hmm. day to day. Mm -hmm. All right? well, obviously it's affecting the lives directly of thousands, yes. but by and large, it doesn't affect the people in the United States of America, right? So on a far more personal level, because that's what truly matters here, I want to discuss the 1977 Hudson River War, which died in its infancy, by the way. Because that war was un... That war... You ever heard of this? No. That war, that conflict, yeah, yeah. was unable to overcome the peace. It didn't make history books. No, it didn't make the history books. But it didn't make the world's history books. Mm -hmm. It may be recorded in history someplace else. Okay. You see, in 1977, I was doing graduate work in a mainline seminary. I was doing graduate work in a mainline seminary in the suburbs of New York City. Mm -hmm. And Alice and I were living in a small village up on the Hudson River, just below Bear Mountain, just outside of New York City. And I took a job working mm -hmm. at a boatyard, right? Mm -hmm. Just to bring in some income while I was going through the seminary. And I was doing very manual labor. I mean, very manual labor. The owner of the yard, my boss, gave me every single dirty job there was and worked me as hard as he possibly could. He didn't like me. Now, I, I know for a fact that it wasn't really me that he had a problem with. It was Jesus within me that he had a problem. And he was an older, older Italian man, and it was really very obvious. I mean, now I, I, at that point I was like 33 or 34 years old and I had been the president of a small advertising agency and I had been um, in management and management consultant. 
So it's been a long time since I did manual labor, and he was giving me, like I say, the worst possible jobs. Where if, if a dirty job came along, he'd come to me and tell me, go do this. And he was not gentle about it. He was not nice about it. He was very aggressive about it. So he was really a gruff old guy. And he'd tell me that, and my response consistently to him when he would tell me that, I'd say, yes, sir, okay, and I'd go do it. And I would do it, you know, it says in the Word, whatever you find to put your hand to, do with all your might. Whatsoever you do, do is unto the Lord. So that's what I did. Cheerfully. Cheerfully, yeah. That made him madder yet. Mm -hmm. That always made him madder because it was like, you know, he was, he was trying to get my goat, is the expression, and he, he just wasn't doing it. One day at that boatyard, a small group of men, there were boat owners there in the boatyard, uh, came up to me, and they said that they'd been watching what was going on. They'd been watching this going on because it was going on every single day. And they asked me, they said, you know, why don't you just go punch this guy in the nose? Which I probably could have done. And I explained that the reason that I responded the way I responded was that I was following the teachings of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. Now just, just listen to these verses. And this is all from chapter 5. They got the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew, right? Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter, starting 5, right? And these are just some of the things that Jesus said in that. And if you're not familiar with this, please spend time in the Sermon on the Mount. As a matter of fact, we have a 29-hour study, 29 sessions, about an hour apiece, up on the Bible Talk website. If you missed that, they're there. But think of these words of Jesus. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult and persecute you because of me. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's the teaching of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't me, but it was God's love in me and the unshakable joy that he had given me along with the perfect peace that I had in the midst of all of this, the evidence of his work in me that led a couple of men those day to pray with me to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, we talked about that a little bit last week. That when we are living this fruit of the Holy Spirit, it will affect everybody around us. That's right. Okay? Now, the verse that we started with shows, unlike the world, Jesus taught that peace is calm and confidence in the midst of conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay? He doesn't make conflict always disappear. As a matter of fact, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous, right? Yes. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for testing. Right. All through Scripture. And then look at the life of Jesus. Look at the life of Paul. Look at the life of the apostles. Do they avoid conflict? Hardly. But the peace that passes understanding, the peace that Jesus gives, is what brings calm and confidence in the midst of all of that. You know, this, is, this is really a, a great way to see this. I'm... I was going to say, I'm sure you know this account. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Of Jesus was teaching, and he was with the apostles, and he's teaching this crowd. And when he gets through, he says to them, we'll go to the other side. They're on the, sea, the banks of the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. So he says, All right, we're going to go over there. And they get in the boat, and as they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, this massive storm rose. And the apostles... Now, you know, if you don't know the account, it's in you know, Mark chapter 4. Jesus is in the back of the boat sleeping. And the apostles go to him and they wake the calm, sleeping Prince of Peace. Mm. And they wake him with these words. Do you not care that we're perishing? So then it says in Mark 4.39, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. See, the voice of Jesus can still the stormy sea and bring calm. But he said, peace to the sea, right? 
So then after rebuking the storm, he rebuked the disciples mm -hmm. for their lack of faith. Now I want you to think about this. This takes a little thinking. All right? They were looking to Jesus for a solution, right? Mm -hmm. They went to Jesus. They're looking for him to solve the problem. Yes. That sounds nice. That's, that's even called prayer. Conversation with Jesus in my book is called prayer, all right? Right. But he rebukes them for their lack of faith. Their prayer expressed their lack of faith. Mm -hmm. They were looking to him to solve the problem. The Word of God says, it says in Hebrews, to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the perfecter of your faith, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so they were looking to him, but they weren't, if they were looking at him, they were not seeing his lesson, all right? They weren't seeing, they weren't learning from watching him, his peace. So they weren't, they weren't inspired by his peace. They weren't inspired by him. He's a perfect peace. He's a perfect this, peace. Yes, this whole but they weren't inspired. They weren't motivated. They weren't changed by seeing Jesus. And it, Paul says we're to imitate him. him. Right. Well, you, you know, if you're going to imitate somebody, you watch them to see what they do. Well, if he's not concerned, why yeah. are we? Right, exactly. So the point is, you know, they're, they're looking to him for a solution, but they're not looking at him and learning from him. And he rebukes them for that. Right. Okay. Now, just this is an important aside. I don't want to, this is not, pay attention. <laughs> pay attention, I tell you. Okay. Four years of Latin I had in Catholic school. It's got to be worth something. The word peace comes from the Latin word, either pacem, P-A-C-E-M, mm -hmm. or pax. You ever hear of pax romana, the peace yes. of Rome? Yes. Okay. Yes. But both those Latin words come from a Latin word that is rooted in an agreement or a covenant between two parties. Okay. That's where we get our English word, pact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You make a pact between two people. Right. Right. right? It comes from that same word for peace. Mm. That's why I say, like America and North Korea, have, they don't have peace because they've never come to a covenant. They've never come to a covenantal agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. So now, it's about that a covenant, that agreement that you have with somebody that makes peace. Yes. Right. Talking about that storm, the apostles apparently had not paid attention to, or they heard him say, they, yes. we're going, we're going to go to the, the over side. to the other side. Mm -hmm. Mark 4.35, right. Jesus said, we're going over to the other side. The Lord said to all who will come to him, this is Isaiah 53. Great, great place. He said, Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. That's a pact. Mm -hmm. According to the faithful mercy shown David. Praise God. Okay. In John 16, 33, Jesus said, Listen, listen. Mm -hmm. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. Last week we talked a lot about how joy comes from hearing the voice of God. Well, where do you think peace comes from? Let me, you know, Arthur Burt, uh, our, our dear older brother, lots of people call him Uncle Arthur over in Wales. He's 101 years old now. Mm -hmm. And we've had the blessing to spend a lot of time with Arthur. And, and we'll be sitting together, or we'll be sitting in a conference, and Arthur, who doesn't talk much now, but when he talks... You better listen. You better listen. <laughs> but that's that's something he'll he'll be sitting there and he'll say, listen. Yes. I mean, that's, that's something that's he says, listen. listen. Now, he's not talking about listen to him. No, listen to the... He's listen to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Just think about this. Because this becomes important if you lack peace. <clears throat> the promise, the pact, the covenant, the words of Jesus Christ say, listen. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. So continuing on in that same chapter of Isaiah, chapter 55, where God proclaims in his, that his word never fails. Right? Never. In verse 10 and 11 of chapter 55, he says his word always accomplishes his purpose. He also says, For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. 
The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 55, 12. Mm -hmm. Now think about this. Because in the introduction, I talked about the fact that but for the fruit of the Spirit is all, it's one fruit. Yes. It's all linked and locked together. Mm -hmm. These are pieces yes. of it. Pieces of that one fruit. Joy came from listening to the voice of God. <clears throat> Peace comes from listening to the voice of God. All right? But, listen to that one verse, talking about his love. He speaks out of his love. For you will go forth out with joy and be led forth with peace. Mm -hmm. Joy and peace. Come from listening to the voice of God. Mm. I, I hope that the bells are sounding and the lights yes, are flashing. Yes, yes. All right? The Father, because of his love, sent his word, the word made flesh, who dwelt among us, sent his word into the world for whosoever believes, it says in John 3.16. And the result of the redeeming gift is of love, God's love, is joy and peace. Amen. To whoever believes. I, I mean... That's beautiful. I think this is so cool. Mm. Because the fact of the matter is, the world has no peace. Yeah. And the fact is that most Christians that I meet don't have real peace either. Because they're not listening. Because they're not listening and believing that there is a pact that God made. Yes, Think of this. From 1 Kings chapter 8, 856, the Word of God says, Not one word has failed of mm -hmm. all His good promise which He has promised. Not now, remember word. I said, this is, Jesus said to all who believe. This is to, to do you believe this? Yes. If, you're, if you lack peace in your life, with the situations going on in your, with the conflicts in your life, you have to stop and examine yourself and say, do I really believe? Having looked at the storm on the Sea of Galilee, let's look at one other storm, historical, epic storm now, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was an epic storm along with an epic testimony that shows the evidence of a redeemed life. It's recorded in Acts chapter 27. When Paul was being, remember, if you know this account, Paul had gone to Jerusalem, he got arrested, mm -hmm. thrown into jail in Caesarea, and now he's being transported. After spending two years in jail in Caesarea, he's being transported to Rome to go and stand trial before Caesar himself. So he's being, he's, he's being transported by ship as a prisoner, okay? And an incredible storm arose that threatened the lives of 276 people aboard that ship, saints and sinners alike. Now, with a growing despair and panic, all the sailors, all the soldiers, and all the prisoners aboard gave up their hope of being saved from the storm-tossed sea. That's what it says in Acts 27.20. They gave up all hope, all except for one. The Lord sent an angel, a messenger, to Paul mm -hmm. during that great storm to tell him that he would stand before Caesar. And Paul listened and had a peace that passed understanding. Think of what Paul said. This is Acts 27, 25, and please listen to what this says. This is Paul speaking in the midst of one of the greatest, I mean, every, they're all given up. These are experienced people, tough Roman soldiers. Right. Experienced wins. sailors, they no. And they've given up all hope of salvation. They're going to die at sea, right? And Paul says, Therefore, mm -hmm. keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Amen. Paul had perfect peace. You know, thinking about that, when if the Lord has told you something, and you say, Yes, I believe that, but it's not coming to pass that when you think it should be. So then you start, you move out on your own and try to make it happen. That's our fallen human nature. And that's why, you know, we're going to get into another fruit of the Holy Spirit somewhere mm -hmm. along here, another part of that evidence, uh, you know, that you, you can take before the judge and say, here, I want to enter this into evidence, and that's patience. Yes. One of the examples of peace is a lady that we all know, Bob and Pam. God told Pam that she would marry Wow. Oh, yeah. Yes. If you want to tell that story, it might be a good little indicator. Yeah, kind of long. Well, yeah, kind of long. It's just she, 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 yeah. stood, fast. she yeah. stood fast on what yeah. God told No, Mark her. has a, a good point. I mean, <laughs> Pam had heard from the Lord mm -hmm. that she was going to marry Bob. Yes. 
Yes. I mean, before before they really even knew each other. Exactly. And she actually heard that she's going to get married to the person that walks in. Yes. Next. And that was Bob. Yes. Yeah, Bob. But she had an absolute confidence in what she had heard from the Lord. Right. And it was a, uh, I mean, Pam was living with Alice and I in community at the time. And it was a very, uh, there were troubled waters. It in was those challenging. Days. <laughs> there were some troubled waters, my friend. The sea was angry that day. Yes. Uh, but through that, I mean, you know, Pam's family, her, her father was, you know, all upset. And people were all upset because, you know, things were just going haywire at times. And Pam had a perfect peace because she believed that it would turn out exactly as she had been told. And, you know, that's the point is, this is where this peace had passed. When, when the Lord says, my peace I give you, well, it doesn't come in a, a package. It comes in a word. And it goes into action. It's activated. You know, it's like God speaks that word to you. You receive that word. It's activated by your belief. We overcome by faith. That's right. Right? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by... The, I mean, this is all connected. It's all, it's all connected. It is The word of God is the only logical mm -hmm. thing that I have ever found Absolutely. in my life. Absolutely. It, it, there is perfect logic in God. He is not a God of confusion. He is a God of good order. And it all fits together. So, but again, what we see when Paul stands there on, the, on this storm-tossed ship, which sank, by the way, yes, it did. with none lost. None. none. Because that was God's promise. He didn't promise that the storm would go away. He didn't promise that Paul and the rest wouldn't get wet. He promised that they would make it through. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is one of the things you have to understand, because... One of the problems that we face in the church today is too many churches are teaching, well, if you believe, you know, all, is, all the storms go away and there's no trouble. Well, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've quoted the verse earlier from, from Psalms. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Right. And we wouldn't have to be told that we can consider it all joy when we encounter these various trials, that we exult in our tribulations, because it, those trials, those tribulations are going to be there. But the thing is, we walk through them in perfect peace because we believe what God said. And if you want to go back to Isaiah, I quoted from Isaiah 55, go back to Isaiah 43. Want a little homework for this week? Read Isaiah 43, where God says that you're precious in His sight, and that He gives others in your place. That if you go through the fire, you'll not be scorched and burned. If you go through the waters, you'll not, be, you'll not drown. His prom that's His word to you. And the question then boils down to, do you believe it? And if you believe it, you'll have perfect peace. And if you don't believe it, and I'm not saying it's not a matter of whether you go to church, it's not a matter of whether you tithe, it's not a matter of whether you dress properly on Sunday, it's a matter of whether you believe God's Word, the pact that He has made with you, because that is peace. His pact, His pacts, His pachem, it is His peace that comes through His Word. Amen. And you want to know something? Okay. No, I was just thinking about the heat. He is in control. He is in control. He is faithful. He never fails. No, that's why I read that other that verse. From, and this is, you know, consistent to Scripture. Not one promised Not that one. he has promised has failed to come to pass. You mentioned pact. There, in a legal agreement, there needs to be three things. In, in, in United States law, for a contract to be valid, there need to be three things, yes. What are they? What are they? There has to be an agreement, there has to be uh, the compensation for the transaction, there has to be something that pays for it. Otherwise, in other words, if you enter into a contract with somebody and there's no financial... Uh, right, there, there has to be an offer. Yeah, an acceptance. Acceptance and, and payment. And payment. And in, in this act is, is what you're doing is a, a a legal agreement is is a pact so you could say salvation is an offer it's acceptance payment. and payment that payment on the cross you, you so could, the whole yes. thing is <clears throat> the only way to get the peace that that we're talking about is to accept the Prince of Peace dying on the cross. Absolutely. Mark, Mark brings up that's a good point. I haven't 
uh, say that in a long, long time. But that's exactly right. In law, that, re that requires that to be a, a valid, to be a valid pact, to be a valid covenant, right. to be a valid contract. There has to be an offer and acceptance and payment. The offer is, it says in Deuteronomy 29, I set before you life. life. Yeah. Choose life. Mm -hmm. God offers us life. For mm -hmm. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. So that's God's offer. Right. That's, that's his offer. We accept that by faith. We're the, you know, you, you got to be the whosoever who receives this offer from God, right. and the payment has been made. And this is why Paul says in Romans chapter twenty-eight, in Romans chapter eight, rather, that if if God loved you so much that He gave His only begotten Son, what good thing would He withhold from you? Mm. If God is for us, who would be against us? Mm. This is where peace comes from. This is why Paul had this incredible peace demonstrated throughout his you know life as an apostle, right. is the fact that he believed in God's love. What can separate me from the love of God? And this is how you get to know what that agreement is. Is in the Word. Is in the Word. You've got to read it. You've got to know yes. what's in there. And overall, and we, I talked about this a little bit last week, one of the things, the evidence of a redeemed life, is you need to be feeding on His Word. Yes. Because that redeemed life is only nourished and sustained by God's word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know what? Bread and chocolate and steak and hamburgers and chicken, that, that may keep your flesh alive, but hoo ha hoo. You know, it's your flesh that's the enemy of your spirit. That's right. The only thing that will keep your spirit alive in Christ it's is feasting, feeding on the word of God. Yes. So, you know, if you're if you are the redeemed of the Lord, well first of all say so. Hallelujah. So. <laughs> but then you need to examine yourself and say, you know, how much time am I spending in the Word of God? And it's not just a matter, it's not just a matter of sitting down and reading the Bible. It's meditating. Paul, you know, David talked about meditating on the Word. Mm -hmm. Read the Word. Get up in the morning. Spend spend a little time in the Word. Even if I mean if that's all you can do. But get some word in your in the forefront of your mind before you start that day. And then meditate on it. And let God speak to you. Have a conversation with the Lord throughout the day about what you've read. You've got to learn the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about memorizing Scripture. You know, the Pharisees of Jesus' time were great at memorizing Scripture. These guys literally knew Scripture backwards and forwards. And yet, they did not recognize the Word of God when He walked through their midst. One of the things I've heard about um, meditating on scripture is what a cow does yeah, is, is it re, 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 regurgitates the food chews on it some more and it could be just one part of one verse That's right. and there you have our appetizing <laughs> suggestion <laughs> yeah. but it is something that you have to yes. feed on all day you do long. absolutely it, it doesn't say just read the scriptures what no. Jesus said if you abide if you abide in my word, mm -hmm. then you're truly my disciples. You're truly the redeemed. Mm -hmm. And you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? From, from the schemes of the devil who has come to steal your joy, to rob your peace, mm -hmm. to make your love grow cold. That's what he's trying to do in your life. You know, again, I was just thinking about how we need to abide in the Word. Let's live in the Word. Live in the Word, live absolutely. The word. And there's, in the world, they say you don't know anybody and somebody until you live, live with Him. Yeah. So that's how you get to know Jesus. You that's live right. With him. Live with Him. Live with Him. And constant conversation. Yes. You know, uh, I, 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 I'm not new at this. I'm getting older every day. But so are you. That's another story. I've heard so much teaching on prayer about how you have to pray and you know what prayer is nothing but constant conversation with the living God yes. conversation not just you talking to him telling him about what you want listen. it's a conversation listen that's the, remember that? listen. listen and you know what it was Arthur used to say was listen to the whisper listen to the whisper of Jesus yeah, yeah. praise God I've got a question Jesus is the Prince of what he's the Prince of Peace right why, why, why not joy? Why not love? Why not one of the other fruits? Why did he choose peace? 
Well, I don't know if we can answer it now, but it's an interesting thing to contemplate. Well, you know, okay, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Since you asked the question. Of all of the things that Jesus has done, okay, I started by saying peace is the absence of conflict. That's the world's view, okay? Not, not to get too far afield here, but the fact of the matter in our lives, that is to a degree true also. Because you out there in the world, you're, you're running around searching for peace. You know, I don't want conflict with Syria. I don't want conflict with Iran. I don't want conflict with Afghanistan, Iraq, with this, with that. With that. But I'm going to tell you something. If you have not received that free gift offered to you by the Father through the saving work of Jesus Christ, you're in conflict with God. Mm, that's right. You're in conflict with God. And there's only one thing that can possibly bring peace between you and God. You can't go to church often enough to do it yourself. You're not going to get right with Him that way. You can't give enough of your, your possessions, your tithes. The only thing that can bring peace between you and God is the price that was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why He's the Prince of Peace. Because He made peace between me and God the Father. He made peace between you and God the Father. And that's the peace that is everlasting. You know, and peace is like a core. I mean, there's so if you have peace, you can handle anything. One of the things about peace is it might be the most readily observable to an outside person. Because the people <coughs> in your example saw how you had peace. Absolutely. N not your joy, not your love. They saw the peace. But he saw the peace. Right. He passed his yes. understanding. They couldn't understand. But, and that, that's exactly the point that Alice makes and you're making. Yeah. Is it does pass under. They can't, they can't understand that. The, the, the one, you know, Jesus said, when we talked about this, when we talked about love, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the second chapter of this, people in the world, they love people that love them. They can't get to the place where they have the power to love their enemies. That's right. To love the people that hate them, right. the people that abuse them. That takes the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen. That takes the love of God that's been poured into you. And you need peace to love them. Yes. But all, that's why I say all it's of these all, things yeah, are intertwined. It's, it's not like these are you know nine separate things, these yeah, fruit of the Holy yeah. Spirit. They are one thing. You can't lose one fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's like it's like an you know it's like a chain. You cut one link. It doesn't matter which link you cut. That is gone. I mean, whatever it was holding is gone. Back to your little example of the boats. You you had set your mind on loving the guy that was persecuting you. The boatyard. You mean. The the, the boat boatyard. the boat the boatyard guy. And once you could love him, you'd still maintain the joy that you see in the Word that God gave you, Absolutely. and the peace. Mm -hmm. Right. He couldn't take my joy away. No. And try. You know, but, no, but, you know, it's absolutely right. But it starts with, and I have to say this, it starts, it started with God loving me. Yes. And forgiving me, mm -hmm. because I was a dirty rat. You know, I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine, a pastor, yesterday, and we were talking about, I think it was him, right? I was talking about, oh no, last night, uh, we had a meeting with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, good news. Praise God. Our, our job oh, yes. at, at Bible Talk, you know, we proclaim God's Word. We proclaim His good news. But good news, you know, we have a page up on our website on Bible Talk. Mm -hmm. It's called The Good News. You can go look at it, BibleTalk.com. But it starts with this. First, the bad news. <laughs> You're a dirty, rotten sinner. Because, you see, if there's no bad news, you don't need good news. That's right. If there's no sin, and if you don't recognize sin in your own life, failure. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about you're a murderer or anything. It's just falling short of the mark when it comes to God. Mm -hmm. This is what Jesus saved us from, yes. because of God the Father's love. So God, God showed me what He has forgiven me for, and in turn, I love Him. I could never have loved that man who was abusing me, no. had I not had that love for God. And I would never have been able to love God had I not received His love. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Prince of Peace because He brought that reconciliation between me and God the Father. And you want to know something? 
for all of us who are the redeemed of the Lord, it says we have a ministry of reconciliation. Yes. Amen. We have the power to go out and tell people that they can have peace with God. Because I'll tell you one thing. You can't win a war with God. You can't. It says in the Bible, woe to him who quarrels with his maker. That's a battle you can't win. So, you know, you need to make peace with God if you haven't done that already. And then you can have this peace. And that peace, it says that when we're being, God will give us peace with our enemies. That doesn't mean that they won't be not nice to you. No, of course. But they won't, they won't have the power to remove your peace. Nothing will have the power to remove your peace. Look, at, like I, let's, go, let's go back to this thing. Talking about Paul on the deck of that ship. Mm -hmm. This ship is sinking. Yes. It's going this down. It's breaking up. It's yes. breaking up. This ship is going down. Mm -hmm. And I, when I said this before, these soldiers, are these are tough Roman soldiers. These are experienced sailors. Guys, life at sea back today is not easy. Life back then at sea was incredibly hard. This is a terrifying experience. It, and you want to something? Wonderful. I know that because I've been mm -hmm. a, a, in a storm like that at yes. sea where I was on a ship, a, a modern ship, a Great. modern warship that was yeah. literally breaking up at sea from a storm. Yeah. One of the things you just said, there was 272 people? Six, I think. 276 people? Yeah. You know, when I think of a ship that long ago, I don't think it being the size to hold 276 yeah, 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 yeah. people yeah. plus the cargo. Yes. Yeah, and it was about the cargo, by the way. Yeah. yeah. But, but think of Paul had this peace because he had listened to the voice of God. Yes. And because he believed the voice of God. Yes. And he believed that what God said would happen. Period. So now, what is he doing? He is bringing that peace, encouraging all those other 275 people aboard. Mm. Because this is part of the purpose of that peace in our life, is that we would bring that peace. We are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. The, you know, it touched, he was a light that touched in the darkness of that storm to all the people on, around him. The peace that Jesus gives is not because we're kept from the storm, but because we're calm and have confidence in the midst of the storm, believing that one way or the other, we will reach the other side. We know, or we certainly should know, that we're not exempt from the trials of life. And that in spite of the vast number of preachers today who, just like in the time of Jeremiah, were always making promises that they couldn't keep, you know, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace, to the people who are not walking in the Word, walking in obedience to God. Those are worldly people, whether they're called Christians or not, who are looking for the world's idea of peace, the absence of conflict. All right. This, I want to read another scripture. Okay. Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Can I say like Paul? I mean, remember this is about me examining myself to see if I have that evidence in my, in my own life of my redemption. Can I say like Paul, I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told in the face of doctors who bring bad news, That's right. or bankers, or auto mechanics, mm. or lawyers, or bosses. I mean, you know, it's in the face of, oh my goodness, I may lose my job. Do you have peace or don't you have peace? Do you believe that God will provide? My God will supply all of your needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If you believe that, you'll have peace about it. You won't get in a panic because there's a storm in the economy. You know, if you believe Jesus Christ, He said, He who believes in me will never die. You'll live forever. So will you have peace in the midst of a storm when a doctor comes and says you have terminal pimples and you're going to die in 15 minutes? You can say, I'll never die. I have died, and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. I did that. It wasn't so bad. I am eternal. I am eternal, thanks to the work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Can I say like Paul, I believe in God, it will turn out exactly as, I, as I've been told. If you believe His Word, it's going to give you peace. Listen. Okay, this peace that Jesus alone can give, that He speaks of in the Gospel of John, started with this. Remember, I started yes, from reading from John 14, right? John 14 starts this way. Do not let your heart be troubled. 
Believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus said. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story? The, the three young men. King Nebuchadnezzar, the fiery furnace, all right? When they were threatened with that terrible death at the command of King Nebuchadnezzar, they proclaimed, this is Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. He said, if that's the case, we get thrown in the furnace. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image in which you have which you have set up. God is God. God is God. God is God. He's in control. Whatever He chooses, He's in control. But God is a deliverer. They were not sure of their fate, but they were sure of their God. Amen. Can I again, like Paul, in the face of every storm, of every attack of the enemy? who desires our love to grow cold, who wants to steal our joy, who wants to destroy our peace. Wants to fill us with Do fear. I, can I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth for all the world to hear? Mm. If God is for us, who can be against us? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Mm. Those are all statements that Paul made in Romans chapter 8. Yes. That's what happens when you listen to the voice of God and believe that His Word always accomplishes His purpose. Amen. At the end of the day, listen, it's all about the, you know, you, I was going to say, are you sports fans? Mm. Come on. <laughs> I'm not going there. It's about the score at the end of the game. Mm. You know, you don't win at halftime. No. It's about the score at the end of the game. And a lot of games change between... Right at the, you know, end. Yeah, right at the right end. Right at the end. At that last moment. Yes. Our peace is about our destination. Yes. Is that what Jesus said? Yes. I go to prepare a place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our peace is a focus on our destination. Certain and sure that gives peace during the journey. When you are sure of the destination, you will be safe and sound and have peace in the midst of the journey. That's a fact. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. I was just sharing with somebody earlier in a meeting today mm -hmm. that a, a number of years ago, Alice and I were in London and I was preaching. We'd been in England for a while and we were getting ready to fly back the next day and I preached in his church and somebody came up to me after the services were over and they said, I understand you're going home tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I said, only if the plane crashes. That's right. That is home. Only if the plane crashes. And you want to know something? I flew in the U.S. Navy. I flew as an air crewman. I, I flew some of the worst places, the worst weather there ever was. When I got out of the military and started flying commercial, scared me to death. I, I'm serious. Lack of control. That's Absolutely. Right. I right. hated being on a... I, it was not a good passenger. I was, I, I was a terrible passenger. I hated being on an airplane that I had nothing to do with. I mean, it, even in cars, you didn't yeah. like being passenger yeah. in cars. Still to this day, you don't let oh, anybody... Much well, uh, oh, but, but, much but, I mean, this is true. Until I got saved yeah. and came to that place of peace that God is in control. And what's the worst thing that can happen? I mean, if I'm on a plane and I'm supposed to be getting to Timbuktu, I'm either going to get to Timbuktu or I'm going to get home. But I'm going to get where God wants me to be. I have peace about because that now. Because He's in control. Because He is in control. And I believe His Word. I believe His Word. If you were put on trial today, and you want to know something? There are places where people, are, Christians, yes. are being put on trial. Yes, they are. And, and, and they wanted to try and prove or disprove you were a Christian. Could you yes. offer these things into evidence? You know, because... At the, Lots of people go to church who aren't even Christian. That's true. They may put on their Sunday go to meetings, but they ain't living the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's not proof of your relationship. It's not proof of your redemption. Can you could you stand before a judge and say, "I want to offer this into evidence. Mm -hmm. My joy, my peace. When I've been attacked by my enemies, I've had perfect peace. Because that's the proof. That's the evidence." of your relationship with God the Father purchased through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. 
let a man examine himself. We need to come to that place in this day and age because I'm going to tell you something. Without that power of the Holy Spirit, without that love of God poured into your heart, without this fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, maybe you'll make it to that final destination, but you're going to be miserable between here and there. And God has no desire that you should be miserable. God desires, He said, I can that you might have joy, your joy might be made full, and you'd have life and have it abundantly. That is the desire of Jesus Christ for you. It will come when you listen to what He says to you, believe what He says to you, confess what He says to you, and act upon what He says to you. Live it. Live it. So, hallelujah. Well, that's it. <laughs> It's as always, it's a blessing to, to be with you. I mean, and we, we'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know where you're listening from. We enjoy we, hearing from you. We do. We we, do. It's a real encouragement. Yeah, we, it is. We, it's great. Uh, we got an, a message this morning on yeah, Facebook from yeah. somebody who's been watching this series. And uh, it, it's just not, not from here in the United States. No. And, you know, it's just it's real encouragement to us. How it's, it's confirming what God is yes. speaking to her. Yeah. And it's, it so, really good. you know, that is a blessing. And, um, I like eyeball to eyeball. And if we don't get it here, we'll get it one day. So when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Come look me up. After you've had your first conversation with Jesus and everything, come look me up. I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face, right hand to hand, hand. At the banquet table. Huh? At the banquet table. So Father, we just thank, thank you, Lord God. We thank you yes, for your love that you've poured into our hearts. Mm. We thank you for the joy that comes from your voice, Lord God. And we thank you in these troubled, troubled times for the peace that passes understanding. Lord, that, that gives us that calmness in our spirit, that gives us that ability to just stand sure and firm on the rock of our salvation. Lord, let that, what you've done in our lives, let the things that you've accomplished, the things that you're doing in our lives, be visible to others that they might be drawn like that jailer who came to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? Father, let people come to us and say, what must I do to have that joy? What must I do to have that peace? What do I have to do to have that kind of love? And we'll tell them, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So before we leave, once again, I know that Alice wants yes, to I tell do. you. I do. Jesus loves you. A lot. Thank you. God bless you and goodbye until next time.